Hi everybody and thank you for joining me in this new video presentation. Two days ago I shared with you an interesting patient, a woman with atrial fibrillation finally with diagnosis of cardiac sarcoidosis and I wanted just to emphasize the importance of a integrated management of atrial fibrillation and this week just started we had another example so I would like also to share this patient and our experience with it to re-emphasize again the importance of referring the patient with atrial fibrillation to specialized AF clinics and specialized centers for management of atrial fibrillation. I hope you will enjoy this video and join me in my future video presentations. Thank you. The current evidence demonstrates integrated care as a highly effective intervention when applied to the AF population with associated reduction in all-cause mortality and cardiovascular-related hospitalizations. The integrated care approach now recommended by international AF guidelines has a crucial role in improving outcomes in this rapidly increasing population and should be widely implemented in the clinical setting with a strong consideration given to a standardized clinical and patient reported outcomes in the atrial fibrillation. The patient is a 39-year-old man who was admitted after syncope to another center. The ECG in emergency department showed atrial fibrillation and right bundle branch block pattern. The echocardiography was reported normal. Therefore, he received cardioversion and after cardioversion received flecknide for rhythm control. However, the patient experienced recurrence and then was referred to our center for catheter ablation of atrial fibrillation. The baseline ECG shows right bundle branch block pattern in sinus rhythm and it's interesting that he received fleconide despite having a white QRS complex. The MRI makes the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in this patient. Having in mind his syncope and also right bundle branch block pattern, this is interesting to see the late gadolinium enhancement pattern in septum, large area of scar in septum, especially basal septal area. CMR is considered as a diagnostic pillar in the management of non-ischemic cardiomyopathies. Over the last years, attention, however, has shifted from CMR's diagnostic capability toward prognostication in the various settings of cardiomyopathies, including hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Here is a list of several studies which assess the role of MRI in prognostic stratification of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and as in our patient, late gadolinium enhancement is associated with unfavorable outcome and ventricular arrhythmia in these studies. In addition to late gadolinium enhancement, T1 mapping and extracellular volume measurement are also promising techniques for evaluation of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, where both T1 and ECV extracellular volume are usually increased in hypertrophied valves with late gadolinium enhancement and normal in remote myocardial regions. Native T1 and ECV permit to distinguish HCM from, for example, Anderson Fabry disease, which shows decrease of myocardial T1 and normal or decreased extracellular volume, and from cardiac amyloidosis, which usually show diffuse increase in T1 and extracellular volume. The prognostic role of native T1 mapping and ECV in HCM is not clear and should be investigated in future studies. So at the end, with the diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we recommended family screening, genetic analysis, and counseling. And based on the calculated risk over 6%, we recommended ICD implantation in addition to AF ablation. So at the end, I would like to recommend two interesting articles regarding integrated care in management of atrial fibrillation. Once again, thank you for joining me and I hope to have you here in my future video presentations.